Hello and welcome. What we're going to be looking at in this video is we're going to be looking at uh, Aboriginal or Indigenous Australian contexts in literature. And now this uh, video is basically very good for you if you are uh, studying an Aboriginal or an Indigenous text for either the first time or if you're just studying a text and you really don't quite know um, the perspectives, the culture and the people who are behind that text. So if you don't really feel like you know a lot about um, Indigenous culture, then this video is pretty much um, going to give you a, a sort of a bit of a background and a bit of a context towards um, what Indigenous culture is all about, um, a bit about uh, Indigenous people in Australia, and a bit about modern Indigenous literature and what informs it. Because most of the texts that you will be looking at will be sort of modernish texts, ones that have been written in about the last 30 years or so. So having a look at those themes and the things that have influenced um, Aboriginal perspectives and Aboriginal um, people who now live in today's society uh, have changed and have has cer certainly evolved, particularly as um, not only since the arrivals of Europeans uh, 200 years ago, but also as um, Australian society has evolved and also looked at and started to appreciate a lot of the... Um, the, the great and the deep and the very rich um, history of Aboriginal people. So to start with, it is a significant part of the English curriculum. And even if you get an Aboriginal text, don't think of it as, oh, we've got an Aboriginal text. Think of it as an opportunity to learn a little bit more about um, Aboriginal history, Aboriginal culture, and think of it as a way that you can basically explore uh, Australian identity and history as well. Because a lot of um, Indigenous Australian history is tied in with Australian history. Okay, so it is very much tied into the fabric of what makes Australia, Australia. It incorporates the history of both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And it's, it's important to make that dis, um, distinction is that they are um, in many ways separate communities. And together they do form the people who have native title over, over Australia. And uh, the people who I guess have been in Australia, well they have, they've been in Australia the longest. So their connection with Australia and the Australian landscape is much deeper and much more um, enriched than probably what it is for, for many other people. That being said, um, it, no matter which way you look at it, um, ab understanding Aboriginal history is important to really understanding what Australian um, culture is all about and how Australian society operates. Okay, so to start with Aboriginal history, um, the first Aboriginal people basically arrived around about 40,000 years ago, although uh, sort of uh, evidence on this regard sort of varies a bit. So you've got uh, 40,000 years being the very minimum. Most are saying around about 60,000 years. Some are even pointing to about even 200,000 years ago. So it's not 100% sure. The only reason why we can say for certain 40,000 years ago is because radiocarbon dating um, goes back that length and we've got um, uh, things that have been found in, in Australia which basically do go back at least 40,000 years as far as radiocarbon dating can actually tell. Uh, for the rest of the um, evidence that's sort of linking uh, Aboriginal people to being here about 60,000 years ago, there are other uh, pieces of archaeological evidence and it's something that's still very much of debate but the moral of the story is that Aboriginal people have lived in Australia for a very long time. Uh, culture mostly developed in isolation until the arrival of Europeans in 1788. So they were very much isolated from the rest of the world and they had their own culture, their own unique way of existence. They did have some contact with the outside world. They had contact with uh, communities in Indonesia and, uh, and some argue in, in Asia as well. Uh, but mostly it was developed in isolation. Certainly many uh, aspects of at least of the southern tips of Australia were developed in almost complete isolation from each other. The only way they connected with each other was with the connecting between different um, indigenous nations and indigenous groups. And as many as 90% of these um, people unfortunately perished upon the arrival of Europeans, mostly from massive outbreaks of diseases like smallpox, measles and tuberculosis. And uh, the, mo the most unfortunate part of that is, of course, that Many of the Europeans, when they arrived, had immunities built up to some of these diseases. Uh, it still killed Europeans, but it didn't kill Europeans on such a greater number as it did for Indigenous Australians. And so the population um, of 
Aboriginal people in Australia plummeted following um, European arrivals, and it was, uh, and in many cases, people uh, there were concerns that uh, Indigenous people um, may have been completely killed by um, or killed off by Europeans, and it's an unfortunate part of Australia's history, and certainly. Um, the fact that the, the culture did survive is not only a wonderful thing for Australia and a, a wonderful thing for Australia's people, uh, but it just sort of shows that, um, that even just the influence of European settlers was such a huge one for the Aboriginal settlers who, uh, or the Aboriginal inhabitants who already um, lived in, in places that Europeans had taken over and the, and the um, devastation that often occurred to those populations once the Europeans moved in. Okay, so Aboriginal language is another thing of interest because there's not one Aboriginal language. It's not a language. It is a number of languages. So unlike, um, for instance, the Maori, which is pretty Maori language is one language, Australian Aboriginal language has about 250 different forms, or at least it did before European settlement. That number has gone down a bit now. It's less than about 200 now as in terms of still recognised languages. Uh, and even then, there are a number of those which are which are threatened by basically the fact that no one really speaks them anymore, and that a lot of Aboriginal communities also do have their own languages now. Uh, most Indigenous Australians now do mainly speak English, um, so many of the languages have declined for that reason as well. So not only did it, um, did they disappear and just start to decline upon the arrival of Europeans, but they also um, declined as a result of many of them taking up English and also Aboriginal English and other uh, related languages as well, such as, such as Creole. Um, Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal English, shall I say, is a dialect which is basically now spoken by a large population of the Indigenous community. And it's a, it's a language which varies. It is English, but it is in a form of English which basically um, differs between different communities. So... Uh, some communities do speak with uh, a very sort of thick Aboriginal um, language and tone. Some speak in a way that's very similar to uh, standard or normal English. So it sort of varies, and many people who speak Aboriginal English can can pretty much duck back and forth without an issue at all. Uh, it's just when they when they are speaking to their own people, they will speak in their they will use, incorporate words which come from their own culture. And then they'll bring in English words as well. So they'll bring in sounds and words from their own culture. Aboriginal English follows pretty much the same structure as standard English, whereas as opposed to Creole, which has its own um, structure and style, which is why the Australian Aboriginal English is called a dialect and not a language, because it follows most of the same rules, whereas Creole follows a completely different set of rules. Okay. Um, now, values and beliefs of uh, Indigenous Australians have, have changed significantly. Obviously, the arrival of Europeans had, has, has had a huge effect on Aboriginal communities, and obviously it's going to have a huge effect on their values. One thing I can say that still sticks around to this day is that Aboriginal culture places high values on elders in a group, and uh, particularly uncles and aunties. So anyone who is old, or basically the elders of the Indigenous community are still referred to as uncle or auntie. All right, it's a sign of respect, it's a sign of kinship, and it's, uh, it just signifies their role in the community as, as leaders, as people who um, younger generations can look up to. And it's something that was traditional in a lot of Aboriginal communities, is for families to take ownership of other um, people's children. Uh, not so much in the same way as uh, sort of saying, oh, they're, they're our children as well, but basically as a way of um, signifying that the community is close-knit and that uh, it is the responsibility of the elders, of the older people in the group to lead the new generations in the right direction. All right. Respect and value also goes towards um, the land and, as I mentioned before, their community as well. So there's a huge emphasis placed on, particularly for Indigenous culture, on the community, but also of the landscape as well. It's something that um, did, uh, with the arrival of Europeans, uh, really affect the way that a lot of Aboriginal people live because they had such a, um, a way of living off the land. And once Europeans started putting up, or British and, and Europeans started putting up fences and started putting up um, boundaries to say, no, you can't go here, this is our land because we've marked it, 
this is when it really started to affect um, how a lot of Aboriginal people lived and it really did force them into um, adopting the ways of European settlers because of the fact that uh, a lot of uh, sort of farmers and, and um, white settlers had started to establish boundaries where other people couldn't cross and if they did cross them then in many cases they would um, try and cause harm to them. So respect and value for both the land and the community is still a huge part of Indigenous culture and certainly when uh, you see protests for Aboriginal land rights it's not just about um, trying to get ownership of the land, it's trying to have a little bit of the land which they can still call their own and still have a connection with. Many Aboriginal people today have lost of touch with a lot of their traditional heritage and it's something that is um, apparent with essentially how Australia has evolved as a culture and as, as Australia still becomes more and more one culture a lot of Aboriginal people don't really know much about their heritage. Some do and some really do um, uh, really do uh, a lot of work within their particular community but there are also a lot of Aboriginal people who um, don't for instance identify with being a particular tribe, don't identify with um, a particular community, they just they identify as being Aboriginal. Okay, so there are some who do still identify with that. There are some who still call themselves part of a particular nation or a particular group, but many now are sort of moving into normal, uh, or I wouldn't say normal, but mainstream um, communities and losing a bit of their heritage, which is a bit sad because you, you want to see people um, be able to keep their heritage in some form. Okay, Aboriginal de dream time once informed many beliefs, and this is something that I, I guess is relatively common among a lot of Aboriginal stories, particularly of dreaming stories. Not to say that all of them are the same, but there were some that were quite similar. However, many have since adopted mainstream religions such as Christianity. Um, Islam particularly has picked up um, in the last 10 years or so. But it once formed many of the beliefs, although not so much obviously anymore. Um, but it does again show that, that there is a strong connection of land between the land of Indigenous people and certainly uh, a lot of uh, Indigenous Australians do have a lot of respect for uh, their, for where they live and also the, the landscape that they're a part of. Okay, moving on to communities and cultures. Now, there are hundreds of Indigenous tribes, as I mentioned before, which most were distinguished by their language or their regional association. So, as I mentioned before, there were 250 languages, at least before Europeans arrived, and most of the communities were sort of divided by those languages. Some communities had even more um, than one language, but most had their sort of their own language and their own um, distinctions. They, they had their own places where they would where they would gather food, where they would hunt, where they would live. Um, many just had their own sort of communities, their own tribes. Most of the communities, uh, or uh, most of the Aboriginal nations, had a number of different communities living within them. Um, some joined them together. Some were a bit uh, separated from each other, but Basically, the, the regional and language associations is how you can essentially group um, a lot of indigenous communities. Uh, cultures, values, and belief systems varied between these communities, and particularly, they were fairly similar between communities that were sort of close to each other, but it sort of goes on, and, and as you go further away from a particular community, the values start to, um, start to change a bit, and if you ask for instance, you're a, a person living in, for instance, a Aboriginal community in Sydney and in um, Perth, there would be a wide gap between their sets of beliefs because of the, first of all, the distance. Uh, but second of all, because the communities are so far away from each other, you've basically got a completely separate community. So there's not one culture. There are lots of uh, smaller and niche uh cultures and community beliefs within certain nations, within certain groups, and that's just given the size of Australia being so huge. Uh, indigenous culture could be rarely described as ubiquitous for that reason, so it's not, there's not a common thread, uh, or there aren't many common threads that links all Aboriginal people together. Obviously the identity does, and that's something that we see a lot of now, is that a lot of people are united through their identity and through uh, aspects of their culture, but uh, the tribes themselves, or the nations themselves, should I say, uh, have very um, varying beliefs and, and varying um, values and also varying um, ways of going about things. So some, uh, 
for instance, in, in terms of art, in terms of music, some had varied styles. If you go between different parts of Australia, you would see different styles of arts, different styles of music. Not everyone played the didgeridoo. It's only a small part of Arnhem Land, in fact, that played the didgeridoo, um, I think, for memory. And there are basically uh, a lot of aspects of indigenous culture which uh, uh, vary between different nations. Many communities are linked, as I said before, and that's mainly uh, through the connection with place and beliefs as well. So they can be grouped by certain connections with, um, with place and beliefs, and certainly people living within the same sort of region uh, had similar sorts of beliefs. But it's just as further as you go, um, beliefs do start to slowly and steadily change until they're completely different by the time you sort of um, go a certain distance. And that's basically what this is... Um, what you what you think when you um, you're thinking that their communities are linked, but they are different as well. All right, now a lot of the text that you will be focusing on will will deal with um, some aspect of the stolen generations in some form. Now, as most uh, texts that you'll read or or you'll watch or you'll come across come from a modern um, Australia. Uh, the Stolen Generations forms a huge part of what makes up a lot of Aboriginal communities now because a lot of Aboriginal communities um, had children taken, had uh, many children did, um, and many children who are still alive today, most of them, uh, or many of them are still alive, and many of them can still tell stories about what happened during um, that particular time when they were taken away from their families when they were taken away from their communities and forced to grow up for what was considered to be um, their protection. Okay, so it is a very unfortunate part of Australia's history. Of course, we had the apology speech in uh, 2008, um, and that was apologising for what happened during the Stolen Generations, um, and apologised for the government's policy of removing Aboriginal children from, from their families and stealing their children away. Um, and when you uh, are, d are discussing this issue, and you will be, if you do get a text um, to do with this issue, it will be a prominent theme, it will have a prominent um, uh, part of the text, then you need to be very sensitive with how you um, discuss it. Particularly, you need to make sure that you do um, try and get as many facts as you can and try and get as, um, as close to, I guess, the... Um, understanding the experience as possible because it would have been a very horrible experience and certainly it's one that you want to be talking about in a very sensitive and, and very um at least very informed kind of way all right many were taken by government groups and sent to live in church missions and orphanages so many of them were taken away not only from um their homes but they were sent to live in uh in church missions and orphanages places which tried to in, um, indoctrinate many children with with uh, European values. For instance, obviously with, with the church, Christianity was a huge part of that. But also uh, various other orphanages was to try and um, educate them, was trying to get them to basically um, live like Europeans do. And they felt that that was the best thing for them to do. That was the best way to uh, apparently civilise Aboriginal people was to send them to these homes, which if you think about it is a really that's well, a really silly idea, first of all, but also it does represent how horrible it must have been for those children to be completely removed from what they call home and what they call their family and their identities. Um, governments believe that, at, particularly when they introduced this policy, that Aboriginal Australians would die out or that children needed protection. And again, this is one of those really... Um, it's a very strange argument when you look at it now, and, and certainly it, it was a strange argument then. It was a very controversial argument when it was first brought in, and it's one that for some reason stuck around until 1960s. Um, and again, it was to do with this um, belief that Europeans were superior in some way to Aboriginal citizens, which again wasn't true. It was something that um, Europeans often spread, and Europeans felt like, or particularly... Um, white Australians felt like they had to do when really they didn't have to do it. So many English texts, as I mentioned before, do reflect these stories and do um, have some account of these stories when you are um, when you're reading or when you're watching them. You'll be 
really um, ask to undertake an understanding for what these children must be going through and to understand um, the, the kinds of experiences and the kinds of emotional reactions if you were taken away from your family in the middle of the night. Um, how would that feel? And really, it just requires a very sensitive touch. It requires you to really um, take a, a, an empathetic role and to really um, understand, I guess, the perspective of those who, who were taken and who were sent to live in these conditions. Okay, if you're looking at Aboriginal culture now, then you're looking at Aboriginal culture which has essentially started to really align with Western culture and incorporates many modern styles. So if you look at um, Indigenous music, art or culture now, a lot of it is starting to really mesh together with, um, with I guess, the, the rest of Australian culture. All right, so for instance, um, Many Indigenous Australians are recognised through the sport and the arts, and many of them incorporate aspects of their own community and also of the Australian community as well. So a lot of Aboriginal music has started to incorporate elements of hip-hop before in the sort of about the 80s. A lot of Aboriginal music started to incorporate rock music and sport. Uh, Aboriginal athletes are very prominent, particularly in um, the NRL and the AFL. So uh, it, they have, a lot of Indigenous uh, people have... Um, have essentially aligned themselves in some way with, with Western culture as much as they do with their own. So they keep part of their own culture and their own identity, but they also have um, a connection with Western culture as well. Um, artistic groups and professional sport organisations for that reason still uh, frequently work alongside governments and welfare programs. And the reason for that is because a lot of Indigenous role models have gone into the sports and the arts. And so a lot of um, sport organisations and... Um, and artistic organisations do partner with the government to help get the messages across that are going to benefit Aboriginal communities. And there are a lot of um, social issues now in Aboriginal communities which um, do need to be addressed. And this is where often sports stars and, um, and entertainers, those who have gained prominence in Australian culture, uh, go back to those communities and work with governments who are trying to um, intervene in certain areas and certainly try and in many cases, um, bridge the gap between uh, Aboriginal Australians and, um, and the rest of Australia. Now, as I just mentioned, there are many social and health issues which do remain prominent in Indigenous communities, and especially when you compare them to the rest of the Australian population. For instance, there are higher ratios of substance abuse among um, Indigenous people than there are from the rest of Australia. There are also lower educational outcomes Far fewer Indigenous children um, finish high school compared to um, the rest of Australia. Abuse of children in many communities is a, a, is a factor as well. Um, lower life expectancy and health issues. Many um, Indigenous people still um, have a lot of health issues. The average life expectancy of an Indigenous person in Australia at the moment is about 21 years old, as opposed to the rest of, oh, sorry, the average age is 21, as opposed to um, the average age of a, of a um, white Australian is about 37. So there's much lower life expectancy um, and there are many health issues for Indigenous people. And also there are much higher rates of imprisonment as well. So there are many um, issues in the community and also you will find a lot of the texts um, that talk about modern Aboriginal Australia do make reference to these um, sorts of things, that many Indigenous people do not feel a home in, ed in education, that they don't feel like school is for them. Many of them, uh, well, many people are, um, are, do have problems with substance abuse and, um, and health issues like that as well. So there are many issues in the Indigenous community and that's why it's so important now that particularly a lot of people who are learning about Aboriginal culture in Australian schools, also learn about the sort of effects that continue on in the Indigenous community so uh, we can continue to work together towards um, bridging those gaps between um, Indigenous populations in Australia and the rest of Australia. Okay, so in summary, Indigenous culture is one that's quite rich and quite varied. And certainly um, when you look at it, have an appreciation for how the community is centred, how it's organised, and in particular how Indigenous communities in Australia do operate. Um, they incorporate many ideologies, they have many varied and, um, and different beliefs which are 
uh, many of them are um, involve a strong sense of community and a strong sense of um, ownership of, of land and also of, of family. And there are many different ideologies similar to that, which basically reflects who they are as individuals and as people, just as, with, as there are with everyone. And also look at it in terms of the history of oppression since European arrival. All right. There are many things that you do have to um, think about in an empathetic sort of way and in a sensitive way. You don't want to um, think about it in a simplistic fashion, okay? Because uh, particularly these things, if you if you I guess put the shoe on the other foot and think about what it is um, or what it would be like if it was you, then um, you would probably think a little bit differently about it. And certainly by um, feeling a bit of empathy and, and certainly um, having sympathy for those who have um, had their communities taken away from them and, and have been removed from their families, you do, uh, you do or you should um, have a bit of sympathy for, for the things that um, they have been through. But otherwise, that's it for um, just a basic understanding of um, Indigenous Australian culture. So until next time, I'll see you later.